Good morning, everybody. So great pleasure to be here with you again. Um, and uh, today what I want to share with you is uh, how our cities are evolving and this kind of convergence between the natural and the artificial. But to, to look at this, I wanted to start with a lot of this convergence that happens over the past few, few years and decades, starting from the natural world, starting from humans and augmenting humans with technology. And if you look at this, you know, this is what has happened with cyber culture. This is what has happened also in the past, really with the idea of augmenting humans with, uh, uh, with technology. But today, something interesting is happening in our cities. Our cities are being covered, layered with digital. The internet, you could say, is becoming internet of things, is entering the space of our cities. It's this kind of new hybrid dimension that you see here. And this is opening up a new, a new possibility by the way, I, so I need to tell you, I'm uh, uh, in this era of COVID, I'm actually connected from an airport today. So I think there's a bit of noise sometimes. So you might hear some, some voices on and off. Um, so I was saying, you know, you, this convergence between bits and atoms with us in the middle is the internet becoming internet of things. And this is allowing us for something new to happen. And what I mean by artificial and natural. You know, I, I usually refer to the beautiful definitions given that by Herbert Simon, a great you know, researcher, Nobel Prize winner from the 20th century. Um, and uh, the, so if um, over the past few decades we've explored, as we were saying, the, the hybridization between the natural world or the human world and the artificial, today we can look at something different. How actually the artificial can merge and blend with the natural. And I think that's one of the key challenges we're seeing in architecture today. You know, going from the artificial world, from the world of cities, of buildings, of objects, um, and hybridizing that with, uh, with the natural world. Um, and I want to start with a very old project. You know, this shows you this. You know, te technology, sensors, and intelligence are at the core of this hybridization. So in this project was, it was one of the first projects we did. Uh, this was the Venice Biennale. Um, around 15 years ago. And in this project, for the first time, we actually looked at data in real time coming from the city. In this case, the city of Rome. We were collecting, as you see here, data from the cell phone network, from taxis, uh, from public transportation, buses, and so on, sending all this information to the cloud. Well, this was actually almost like an initial cloud to our servers at MIT, then analyzing this and sending that back to the exhibition at the Venice Biennale. And so this idea of a city that responds in real time, that is, can, can through sensors be described in real time, you know, um, was kind of, became kind of feasible with, um, with cell phones and smartphones being distributed to all of us. So here you see some of the visualizations of this project in, in Rome. You can see this other visualization. This was done by Pedro Cruz from our lab at MIT. It was uh, a visualization that ended up at MoMA, the Museum of Modern Art in New York. And here you see Lisbon described using billions and billions of data points collected from the taxi network. Again, you know, all of this allows us to see a city, the world of the artificial, almost as a living thing. Here, thanks to sensors and intelligence, we can kind of read the life that wasn't visible before inside our cities. And then you've got this data, you can analyze it and, uh, and find out interesting things. Again, this is taxi data, this is uh, New York. What you see here, you've got different dots, you know, the, the yellow dot is a taxi pickup, the blue dot is a taxi drop-off. Here is JFK Airport. If you zoom out, you see JFK Airport was down here on the image, and you see Manhattan and, uh, and all of the boroughs. And then you can apply interesting analytics. For instance, one of the questions we ask ourselves is, you know, how many taxi trips could be shared in New York? If you look at those two points, you got a significant number of trips in the course of, over the course of a year. So the question is, how many of those could be shared without much inconvenience to people within a limited delay. So we looked at this in this case, the analytics developing a new methodology that we call shareability networks, as you see on this uh, image. And what we discover, and we discovered this before Uber launch, Uber pool or similar things. What we discover is that at the time, <clears throat> what we discover at the time is that in New York, you can actually take everybody to destination when they need to be there, give or take a few minutes two, one, two, three minutes, as you see there, a delta in delay, but you know, very, very limited delay, but by reducing the total number of taxis by 40%. And you know, when we did this, as I mentioned, um, Uber didn't, uh, Uber pool didn't exist, uh, but 
with this project, we started a large collaboration with, uh, with Uber between MIT, our lab, and, and Uber. As, uh, and um, as you know, today Uber Pool does exactly this. A lot of people going more or less in the same direction to share the ride, uh, which means one less car on the road, which is uh, less congestion, less energy consumption, uh, you know, less, uh, less cars potentially in our cities. So that was again a very little story starting from the city, how we can understand the city like a living organism through data. We can analyze the data then and through data analytics, we then start thinking about how the city could be reprogrammed in different ways, which is something that we know in another paper, this is more recent from a, a year and a half ago, where we, we looked at another problem, again with a lot of data in New York, about what we call the minimum fleet problem, which is you know, what is the minimum number of vehicles we need for to keep Manhattan on the move. In this case, without sharing between sharing trips, without ride sharing, but simply by doing better dispatching. And uh, the, the same approach can be applied to many other dimensions of our buildings and our cities. For instance, a few years ago, we started looking at energy consumption on the MIT campus. And what we discovered, that's a paper, if anybody's interested, by the way, all the papers are uh, on our website at MIT. Um, and um, <clears throat> what we discovered is actually that uh, there's no correlation whatsoever between energy consumption and where people are. In other terms, we waste a lot of energy because we are heating or cooling empty buildings. But then we started thinking, and what about trying to develop a new paradigm for, for, um, uh, for warming? Let's start from looking at, uh, at heating building. We call this local warming. We did a first test outside the MIT campus. And uh, what we did, we, we created those kind of collimated infrared uh, uh, beams that would actually uh, allow to create almost like a bubble of heat around people entering the MIT campus. And also this bubble of heat could be customized. So based on your preferred temperature, you could have kind of your own heat bubble. So you don't need to heat the whole place, the whole atrium at MIT, but you can actually just focus heating where it matters, which is close to people. Well, you know, um, the, the installation had a lot of success. Some of the visitors to MIT freaked out, you know, not the MIT students or researchers, quite, quite used to, uh, to strange things happening on, on campus. But by doing that, you know, then we expanded the system uh, again, at the, at the Venice Biennale, you know, the Venice Biennale is a great exhibition happening in Venice every couple of years uh, that allows you know, to experiment a bit uh, some of the boundaries of, uh, of our discipline. So here's actually the, the making of, uh, of our installation, I remove the music, the making of our installation at the Venice Biennale. And what you see here, you see, uh, you know, this is a team from MIT mounting everything. You see all these different um, uh, collimated beam projectors that actually then follow people and uh, would create a bubble of heating uh, next to them according again to their, their preferences. Now, again, if you're in, a, in an exhibition at the Venice Biennale, you want to make the system very, very visible, but then, you know, you can also think about uh, how to integrate this uh, into, in a more subtle way into a real office setting. And that's actually what we've been doing over the past few years at the Agnelli Foundation headquarters in Turin, Italy. Uh, and what you see here is actually the first building where all of these systems that you see on the ceiling, they respond dynamically to occupancy, into heating, lighting, and cooling. So that the building again becomes a bit like a living building. It knows information about how it's occupied. It uh, processes the information with analytics, with different type of artificial intelligence, and then it responds to that by, by changing the internal conditions. So here you see some, some, of the, some of the interiors of the building. Uh, you see here the panels that actually control heating, lighting, and cooling uh, on the ceiling. And also in the historical part of the building has two sides, a new one, the old one. Also in the old one, you know, the same system, the same intelligence uh, goes and applies use sensors to better understand uh, the, the, the conditions we have, and uh, in this case in the building, and then intelligence to respond dynamically to those uh, conditions. And here are some of the images of the building. In other cases, we can actually use just projections and pixels, moving pixels to bring life to, uh, uh, to our places. And uh, this is a project in a, a small apartment we designed. In this apartment, we got a projector in the middle that actually allows projections potentially, thanks to a small rotating mirror in, re, in automated recalibration to happen, projections to happen 
all around it, 360 degrees. And so if you've got this apartment, you can see, you know, every surface can become an interactive display surface, as you see, just from one single point. You can leave the place as a very nice space also when everything is off, as you see here. But when you turn it on, then, you know, every, every surface, every wall becomes alive with uh, uh, digital information. In this project, we explored another dimension of how actually we can uh, use technology to make our buildings, our spaces more interactive. This project was actually the World Expo, the World's Fair in Milan in 2015, exactly five years ago. Um, and the theme of the expo was feeding the planet. So we were asked to do two pavilions. One pavilion was a pavilion for New Holland as a big farming equipment producer. The other pavilion was actually the pavilion that was called the Future Food District. Um, expos are great, uh, have always been uh, great places to explore the future, to, 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 to play with new technology and so on. In this case, we were asked to actually do a pavilion that would deal with supermarkets and selling food. Again, the overarching theme was feeding the planet. So in this case, looking at, uh, at how we could imagine a future supermarket. And we knew what we did not want to do. We didn't want to do this. It's a beautiful picture by Andreas Gursky, but an alienating wow. image of a supermarket of the 20th century. Our inspiration was more um, this little story by Italo Calvino, the Italian writer. It's about Mr. Palomar. Mr. Palomar is a character who's a little bit aloof, a little bit provincial. And one day he goes to, to Paris, goes into a cheese shop and start, starts thinking about all the stories behind every piece of cheese. And little by little, the shop becomes uh, like a museum. He says, like the Louvre Museum. And uh, uh, so that was our inspiration, how we can actually tell more what is behind every product. You know, if we are able to do that, then we can actually make sure that consumption is, is more informed. Um, another image that was our inspiration is this beautiful painting by Guttuso, you know, where you see the richness of interaction between people and products and people and people through products in a traditional market. Well, how to do that in the framework of a, of a modern supermarket? The way we did it was first of all, to put everything on, on tables. You know, tables have been beautiful interfaces as humans, we've been using tables for thousands of years to eat together, to sell things to each other, you know, to meet. And on the top of the table, we put a lot of Kinect sensors that uh, um, detect people when they approach the table. And uh, then the idea is that as soon as you approach a product, the product naturally, seamlessly will start, uh, you know, showing information about, uh, about itself, presenting information. Again, if you buy an apple, as you see here, you can buy still in, in one sec, in one second. Um, but if you got three seconds, you might learn a bit more about that. And if you go like 10 or 15 seconds, you might even see perhaps the orchard from where the apple is, uh, is coming from. Well, we also wanted the, <clears throat> the supermarket to be organized a bit like a theater with all this product on different, uh, different levels. You see it here. So at the entrance, you will see all of them in, uh, in one go. And then with the different layers of information on the physical layer, but then also digital layer above it and aggregated layers still above that. And here you can see actually the built, uh, the built pavilion was actually one of the most visited one at the expo was both a pavilion and actually a real supermarket. Um, it won a few design prizes as well. You see all the different tables, you see actually different type of interactions happening inside. You see different layers of information as I was saying before over here and actually people playing with it. Kids love the kids would jump from one product to another one and to see while seeing this accordion of information, uh, you know, appearing in front of them. And then again, you know, if you only have a few seconds, information can be quite basic, you know, what's the price, nutritional values, carbon footprint. But then the more you interact with something, the more it reveals information about, uh, you, you, you discover information about that, uh, that product. And here's a short video actually uh, showing the, the experience inside the supermarket. Now, I also want to show you how we can bring nature into the artificial, merge the natural and artificial in a different way, which is actually to bring nature itself. And, um, and so the first thing we've seen so far is how we can merge the two by using sensors, artificial intelligence actuators, in order to turn the world of the artificial, the world of the city, the world of a building, into something that behaves much more like the world of the natural. But as I was saying, the other way is to really bring physically the world of the natural inside what we design. For instance, this is a building which is under construction at the moment in Singapore. 
where we try to, to bring nature in the core of the building. It's one of the tallest skyscrapers in the city. And in the middle, as you see here, there's a, a, a very large public space. It's a space for people on the two sides of the building to come together, to enjoy time together, uh, to work from there. It's almost like a tropical forest uh, facing and uh, you know, looking around and uh, uh, floating above the city of Singapore. So in this case, again, there's a lot of technology as well. If you want to create a tropical forest, high above Singapore, you also here need to have a lot of control, a lot of sensing to make sure that all the environmental parameters are correct. But again, the idea that nature itself can also hybridize with, uh, with our buildings. And here are some other images of the lobby, of uh, uh, the, the po above the podium and so on. Or in this other project that we did at, uh, a couple of years ago at Milan Design Week. Milan Design Week is, uh, you know, one of the, one of the large events where all of the world of design comes together in the same city for a week. It's usually in April in the city of Milan. Uh, this year was canceled because of COVID, but you know, hopefully will happen again next year. And two years ago, we are asked to do the opening act for Milan Design Week. And uh, the organizers wanted us to really think about the, the crucial issues facing design today. And for us, you know, those issues are the ones we're discussing today. The first one is about nature. How can we bring more nature into our cities or hybridize, in other terms, the natural and the artificial world? And clearly another big challenge is about climate, how we can control climate better, both at the global scale, I mean, facing climate change, but also locally in our cities, doing climate mitigation. And so what we did here was do a pavilion that would try to <clears throat> kind of work and, uh, and develop those two themes. The pavilion, as you see here, uh, had behind, this, these were still the renderings before it was built. Uh, behind, it, it, behind the pavilion, you see uh, the Duomo, the Cathedral of Milan. It's the main square in Milan. And the, the idea then, we wanted to do a pavilion that would actually bring a magic garden in the core of Milan and the garden where thanks to control and sensors and intelligence, we'll be able to create four seasons at the same time. So in this pavilion, you can actually go from the spring to the summer to the fall to uh, uh, the winter, just in a matter of a few meters. So while you're moving through the pavilion, it's almost like you're moving through time because you're going through the different, uh, different seasons. And so here you see, for instance, we wanted to have the, the, the fall with falling leaves, uh, as well as uh, the other seasons at the same time. Now, this, uh, as I said, this is the, the side of the Cathedral Plaza, Piazza del Duomo. You see that's a royal palace, and this is a beautiful courtyard. So the pavilion follows its, uh, uh, its uh, design. It was inspired by its 18th century in design. And the idea here is you get all the energy from the sun, as you see here. You, you, you convert it with photovoltaics, and then you use that in order to control very precisely heating and cooling. And you know, like in your refrigerator, the very interesting thing is that if you're cooling on one side, you're generating excess heat on the other side. And so here, if you do it in, the, in, the, in, in, in an intelligent way, what you can do is you're creating cooling on the winter side, you're using that to heat the summer. And so you're, you're creating almost like a, a circular exchange for, for heating and cooling, which again is something that people are doing more and more. You know, in the past, all of these kind of cooling and heating loops were not connected. Today, for instance, in most supermarkets, you got uh, all of the refrigerated air area, which produces excess heat, which is used, for instance, for, for heating where people are. So anyway, we try to do all of this in the, in the pavilion, again, to engage with these kind of two very important topics that we think face design today. And you know, the first one, nature and artificial coming together. And the second one um, about how, you know, we can tackle climate control in our cities, climate mitigation, especially, you know, looking, for, looking at what is happening with uh, global climate change. Um, here you see the, the, the built pavilion. <clears throat> Again, you see the, the cathedral to the left and the Royal Palace to the right. Uh, here in front, you see the, the autumn. Uh, here you see the pavilion from the other side on the axis of the, the, the Royal Palace. And then you see the different seasons. So the summer was a really hot, sweaty summer. The winter had real snow, even if during Milan Design Week in April, it was already quite hot. When it was real snow uh, in, uh, on the winter side, you know, the spring had blossoming trees and, um, and uh, summer and fall, you know, here you see the summer again, just kind of sweaty summer and fall had, uh, had fallen leaves. Again, just a short, uh, a short video uh, here with the experience inside. And again, this was for us a way to have people think about those two very important issues, you know, 
nature, as I said, and the other one about uh, climate remediation and climate mitigation. Um, but um, uh, it was it also became a very popular pavilion during Milan Design Week, and all of it, all of what was in the pavilion has been recycled in different ways, including including all the trees that have been planted in the city of uh, of Milan. And uh, as we are started to wrap up, I want to show you a few other projects. First of all, another project at the World Expo. This, in this case, we are in Spain. Um, this was before Milan. In this case, the, the theme of the Expo was not feeding the planet. It was water itself. And so the mayor came to us. This was in the city of Saragossa. And the mayor of Saragossa came to us and uh, you know, said, how could we use technology today to, to use water? Such a beautiful natural material in a different way. And the first idea that we developed was uh, what you see here. Imagine you've got the pipe with many tabs, opening and closing, controlled by a computer. Then you could create almost like a living wall, a wall that can show images or text or patterns, but also a wall that can open up when you want to cross it. It becomes like, you know, again, a, a living material. So the mayor liked the idea, so we got the commission to design the building at the entrance of, uh, of the World Expo. Uh, it was called Digital Water Pavilion. It is still called Digital Water Pavilion. It's one of the few buildings from the Expo that have, uh, have remained. All the walls are made of water, no doors or windows. It, uh, it opens up when you, when you approach it. Inside also the walls are expandable, so they adapt to occupancy, to how many people you have. The subdivision of rooms, you know, room will enlarge and get bigger and smaller based on occupancy. The roof is also covered with a thin layer of water. And then if you've got uh, too much wind, you can lower the roof to minimize splashing. But um, at the end of the day, you can also close the building and the whole architecture disappears. Um, so uh, we did a video at the time and um, we didn't really think that they would build it. But then what happened is that Time Magazine listed it in, the, in their list, uh, their yearly list of best inventions of the year. So in the end, we had to build it uh, in a rush, I think, you know, in, in, in just a number of months before the, the expo. You see here the pavilion before the opening. I like this picture because there's a guy here with a trolley and that guy was going to the, to the train station, which is not that far. But actually he missed the train because he spent too much time looking at the pavilion, trying to, to figure out what the hell was, was happening with, uh, with the water drawings. Um, if you look at uh, this picture was also adding Pixels made of light on the top of uh, pixels made of water. So the combination of the two. If you look at this, was myself trying not to not to get wet, it, testing all the sensors that uh, <clears throat> make sure that you know the system opens up a, a a path for you to enter without getting wet. Um, and I should tell you now what happened one night when um, all of the sensors stopped working. And at night we were terrified because the building would keep on doing its own things, you know, crazy things and cats and holes and so on, but without responding to people anymore. But actually that night was one of the most fun nights ever. That night thousands of kids from, uh, from all over the city went to the pavilion to play a new game. Not anymore a pavilion that opens up to let you in, but the pavilion that you need to engage like this. Again, if you look at this, it's, uh, there's many videos on YouTube. There's actually a lot of kids playing and screaming. You don't hear the sound uh, now via Zoom. Um, but you know, that for us was a, was a very important lesson because you know, as architects, as engineers, we always think that we know how people will use the things we design. But reality is always a surprise. And especially when you hybridize naturally. And I should tell you now what happened one night when all of the sensors stopped working. Well, that night we were terrified because the building would keep on doing its own crazy things and cats and holes and images and text, but without responding to people anymore. But actually that night was one of the most fun nights ever. That night, thousands of kids showed up at the pavilion to play a new game. Not anymore a pavilion that opens up to let you in, but a pavilion that you need to engage like this. You know, you, you don't hear the, the voices here. This is a video from YouTube. There's many others if you want to watch them. Uh, but really, a lot of kids playing and screaming and engaging the pavilion in a different way. And that for us was a very important lesson because, you know, as architects, engineers, we always think that we know how people will use the things we design. But reality, and especially human reality, is always a surprise. And especially when you deal with buildings that actually try to blur the boundary between, between the natural and the artificial. 
Now, I want to finish here uh, with, uh, with the presentation and uh, uh, with, with, with a project I want to share. Again, you know, looking at this, this kind of uh, research that we're carrying out both at MIT in Boston and Singapore, and also with our design office in New York, in Turin, and at the different sites worldwide where we, we are operating, uh, of how you know, we can actually blur this boundary between natural and artificial, both through technology sensors, intelligence, actuators, but also with real nature that comes closer to us, natural material, the water or the trees that enter the built environment. However, I also wanted to finish with one parting thought. And this thought is actually aimed at those who are watching now, who are listening now, who might be students in architecture or young graduates, because you know, the past few months have been quite, uh, have been quite tough. Uh, we've seen the MIT students in you know, over the past few months with the pandemic have had much more difficulties in finding a job, in finding an internship during the summer. I also wanted to mention this kind of thought because it's very Mexican, it's related to, uh, to a very important person in Mexico. You all know this person is Luis Barragan, one of the most celebrated architects in the 20th century. Here's his picture in Calle Ramirez in uh, Mexico City, in his, uh, his office house next to the beautiful stair staircase he built. And you know, the thing about Barragan is that um, he worked for a long time until when he was over 50. He worked first in Guadalajara and then he worked in, uh, in Mexico City. But by doing a lot of projects for clients, he didn't really respect too much. He probably bought and attained financial independence through that. You know, he built a lot in the middle of the 20th century in Mexico City. But then one day when he's over 50, he writes in his... Uh, journal, I'm sick of listening to clients talking about their taste. I'm quitting with all my clients. From now on, I'm going to work for one client only, myself. You know, from that day, he will only design a handful of buildings. Casa Gilardi, the houses del Pedregal, the convent. But with those few buildings, he will win the Pritzker Prize, the Nobel Prize for architecture, and become one of the most influential architects of the second hand of the 20th century. And so, why I'm saying this? I'm saying this because too, if you're just graduated, today you can actually do like Barragan, but without having to wait until when you're, you're over 50. You can actually do that much faster. And the difference is that today you can leverage the network that Barragan didn't have at the time in order to start from an idea, start from a dream, and then try to find support online. Start from a dream, dream first, and clients later and then find support, say, on crowdfunding platform in other different ways. And this happened to us a few times, and I want to tell you the last time it happened was with a project that initially originated, as you saw before this image, at the World Expo in Milan. As I told you, you know, that we took that facade and turned the facade into, into a giant plotter. And we also, you know, showing the faces, as I, as I showed before, and, uh, and, uh, and the information about, about it. But uh, also, while we were doing this, we did a, a small... Uh, version of the plotter that we had in our office. And you see it here, it has two cables and it could actually print on a wall and people started using it for crazy things, for doing little selfies with the robot, painting them on the wall and doing other things. And everybody came into the office will stop and look. And then, you know, some people wanted to turn it into, in the office, wanted to turn it into a product. I wasn't really sure. So what we said, we put a high threshold on, on Kickstarter. On Kickstarter, most campaigns are less than $10,000. And we said, well, unless we do $200,000, which is really an extremely small fraction of campaigns that reach that amount, unless we do that, we will not carry it forward. We will not continue. So we did it. We did a video. I will, this is just the beginning, but you can find it online. And uh, uh, then it went on Kickstarter. And believe it or not, became one of the biggest campaigns on Kickstarter uh, of a year and a half ago, I, I believe the total amount was close to $3 million that was raised uh, uh, online on crowdfunding. And, and so because of that, then, you know, then uh, Scribit, Scribit is the name of the leader robot now, had to be produced. You see the final version here, you know, the produced one, it's, uh, it's actually much, much sexier than the one in the video. Uh, again, you know, uh, it just won the, the Red Dot Design Award and a few other uh, awards in, in design. And so it turns every wall into, into a canvas where you can, you can plot, you can put information on your wall and you can actually erase it 
uh, automatically or manually. And so, you know, you can use, you can bring color to your life by actually having a little robot writing in, uh, in the house. Uh, so somehow, you know, how that idea initially that was on the wall in the office, we didn't know what to do with it. And then we put on Kickstarter became a reality. And again, the reason I'm saying this is for all of you who are just, who are just graduated, who might have difficulties before, because of the pandemic, how, you know, you could do what Barragan did, but in a different way. Don't wait until you're 50 or over 50 like he did, but start from the beginning. But don't start from clients or traditional clients. Dream first and find your clients, a community who will support you or some people who will help you turn your dreams into reality. Find them later. And I think that's one of the nice stories about, uh, you know, this new interconnected world we are living in, where the ideas can, uh, can start as ideas and then become reality later. Somehow what Barragan did, but in a different way, and you can do it just right now as you get out of university. Well, I wanted to finish with this, with a little note of hope. Uh, and uh, I really look forward to seeing you next time in person uh, in the beautiful city of Tijuana. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And can you please tell me, uh, how can architecture design the tendencies or the, the, the cities of the future? How will architecture influence in this aspect? I think that design and architecture are at a crucial point. You know, a crucial point that if you use the, the, if you borrow the words of Buckminster Fuller, it could be called oblivion or utopia. You know, if you keep on dealing with, uh, you know, irrelevant issues, with beautifying existing things, then it's going to be oblivion. But if we are able to tackle the big challenges of our time, you know, think about the problems we mentioned, think about climate change, think about segregation in our cities and so on, then, you know, then it's hopefully it's going to be utopia. And so I think you know, that's really what uh, design architecture planning should look at, should really look at these big challenges and find new creative ways to, to address them and to solve them. I think you know, that's really what should be at the core of all of what we do across the planet. Professor, what will be the key inspiring? Where do you find inspiration for your work? Um, yeah, you know, today I think we can find inspiration everywhere. Uh, also, thanks to networks, we can actually what everybody is doing around the world. So the amount of inspiration we have, I think, is immense. If I compare this with, I guess, how people were working like a hundred years ago, they need to look at something published months later or years later in a book or in a in a magazine today we really instantly we know what everybody's doing so we got a huge amount of inspiration i think the important thing is not necessarily inspiration is actually about how to be able to tell a good idea from a bad idea i think that's uh, that's the most important thing we try to teach to our students at mit is something that you know Hemingway, the great writer, Henry Hemingway, once called the bullshit detector. You know, the bullshit detector is probably the most difficult thing at a time when we're often overexposed with uh, new ideas and information. And our last question would, would be, for this generation, what would be the key element that new generations and new architects need to develop and consider on the design in cities? Yeah. Um, I think there's a very important point that uh, we need to take into account today is that, uh, you know, we ca it cannot be just one single architect, designer, planner dealing with the complexity of the contemporary city. And I think we need to recognize that uh, what we do has to be collective work at every scale. And collective work means we also need to work with many, many different disciplines, with many people, but also people from different uh, uh, disciplines. And, you know, that's a, that's, kind of a different idea versus the, the heroic idea of the single-handed architect that people had in the 20th century, this kind of person alone who designed uh, design a whole city single-handedly. Um, it also requires a different education. We need to have people getting out of university being very, very good at what they're passionate about, but also have what some people call a T-shaped education. So the vertical is very, very, the vertical is what you know very, very well, but the T at the top is also your ability to engage in conversation with many other disciplines. In those disciplines today, certainly should include, uh, uh, you know, if you look at the, the, the topics we discussed, should include programming, should include computer science, artificial intelligence, nature, biology, sociology is vital if you deal with the city. So somehow having the ability to, to have a conversation, to be conversant with, uh, with those other experts become vital to, to create the city. And the role of the architect and the planner, I see it more as the role of a conductor. 
I would say, a choral architect who's able to, to harmonize many different voices. Well, thank you very much, Professor Ratti. And well, Tijuana will be waiting for you, Professor, next year. And definitely we would like to see you once more and show you what we have been working on on our region, on our city, and our community. Wonderful.